Tell me again about the 36. The young cadet's eyes gleamed with anticipation as he looked up at his instructor. The old veteran sighed, running his finger along the obsidian memorial that stretched toward the violet sky of Helio 7. The names etched in gold seemed to pulse in the dying light of the binary stars. They weren't supposed to be here, the veteran began, his voice rough from years of breathing alien air. 3rd Platoon, 175th Infantry. Just 36 humans against the might of the Kithrai Empire. But they changed everything. Not just the war, they changed how an entire species saw us. Lieutenant Wade Thorne had known it would come to this the moment the evacuation orders came through. The math was simple and brutal. 20 transports, 20,000 civilians, and not enough time to get them all out before the Kithrai Legion arrived. Someone had to stay. Someone had to hold. He watched the last transport disappear into the swirling storms above, carrying the final group of colonial children to safety. The thunder of its engines faded, replaced by an ominous silence broken only by the crystalline chimes of Helio's Ridge, the vast formation of luminescent spires that would become their final fortress. Status report, he barked into his comm, trying to ignore the growing darkness as Helio 7's twin sunset behind the mountains. The larger red star painted the crystals in blood-red hues, while its smaller blue companion cast deep shadows that seemed to move of their own accord. Staff Sergeant Kieran Frost materialized from behind a crystal formation, his weathered face visible through his cracked visor. The sergeant had seen more combat than the rest of the platoon combined, and his expression told Thorne everything before he even spoke. It's bad, sir. We've got maybe four hours of sustained fighting in our power cells, less if we get into heavy combat. Ammunition is lower than reported. Looks like some idiot at supply couldn't tell his ass from an ammo crate. The good news is these crystals are playing hell with Kithrai targeting systems. The bad news is they'll be here before dawn. Thorn nodded grimly. Around him, 34 other men dug in among the luminescent rock formations. They weren't supposed to be a combat unit. Third Platoon was a support company, responsible for maintaining the colony's defensive systems. But when the Kithrai hit their outlying settlements, every able body was thrown into the fight. Private Ash Sullivan, barely a month out of basic training, was helping Corporal Drake Reeves set up their last heavy pulse cannon. Despite his youth, Sullivan worked with quiet efficiency, his hands steady even as distant explosions lit up the horizon. Reeves, a career soldier with more scars than medals, guided the younger man with surprising patience. Sir. The call came from Private River Walsh, one of their two snipers. You need to see this. Thorne scrambled up the crystalline formation to Walsh's position. The sniper handed him his high-powered scope without a word. Through it, Thorne could see the approaching Kithrae forces in horrifying detail. They moved like liquid mercury in their biomechanical battlesuits, each step impossibly smooth. Their armor seemed to flow around obstacles rather than over them, the alien metal responding to their movements like a second skin. Leading them was a warmaster, its armor twice the size of its soldiers, adorned with writhing tentacle-like appendages that marked its rank. But it was the numbers that made Thorn's blood run cold. The Kithrai Legion stretched to the horizon, walkers, war sleds, and at least 15,000 troops, against his 36 men. He keyed his calm. All leaders on me. Five minutes. They gathered in a natural chamber formed by the crystal formations. The luminescence cast their faces in an ethereal glow as Thorne laid out their situation. Staff Sergeant Frost, Sergeant Boyd Hawthorne, leader of their makeshift scout section. Corporal Reeves, Private Liam Nash, their combat engineer who'd been a demolitions expert in civilian life. I won't lie to you, Thorne said, his voice steady. We're outnumbered 400 to 1. Our mission is to hold this position for six hours, giving the evacuation fleet time to clear the system. After that, he let the silence speak for itself. Frost spoke first, his voice gruff. Those transports are carrying our families, our children. The Kithrai don't take prisoners. We all saw what they did to Outpost 7. So we hold. We hold, the others echoed. Thorne nodded. Nash, I want this ridge turned into a killing ground. Use everything we have. Hawthorne, get your scouts into observation posts. I want to know every move they make. Frost, organize the men into fire teams. We fight in pairs, we die in pairs, but we don't die alone. They broke apart, each to their tasks. Thorne watched them go, these men who'd been thrust into an impossible situation. He saw no fear in their eyes, only determination. Private Felix Reed... Their medic was distributing the last of their combat stims. Corporal Jace Hunter and Private Owen Pierce were testing their backup communication systems. Young Sullivan was helping Nash lay the smart minds, learning as he worked. 
The next hour was a blur of preparation. They used everything they could find, demolished equipment, crystalline shards, even Kithrai debris from previous skirmishes. Nash was a miracle worker, turning their limited resources into a maze of death. The crystal formations became their allies, their natural properties disrupting Kithrai sensors and providing cover. As the last light faded, they could hear them coming. The distinctive whine of Kithrai war sleds echoing off the crystal spires, the heavy thud of walker units, the chittering sound of their battlefield communication. Contact front. The call came from Walsh. Multiple columns, heavy armor support. They're not even trying to hide their approach. Through his enhanced optics, Thorn could see them now. The Kithrai moved with their characteristic fluid grace, but there was something different about their formation. They were being cautious. They had learned to fear human defenders. Warmaster spotted, reported Pierce, Walsh's fellow sniper. Big bastard with the ceremonial markings. Intelligence identifies him as Nixus the Unavoidable. Never lost a battle. First time for everything, Thorne replied, earning a few grim chuckles. The Kithrai halted just outside their estimated weapons range. For a moment the battlefield was silent except for the singing crystals. Then the night exploded. Preliminary bombardment incoming. Frost's warning came just as the first plasma mortar screamed overhead. The crystal formations amplified the explosions, creating a hellish light show of refracted energy. But the same properties that made the rigid death trap also provided them protection. Most of the shots dissipated harmlessly against the natural formations. The bombardment lasted twenty minutes. When it ended, the Kithrai advanced with typical arrogance, clearly visible in the bioluminescent glow of the crystals. Their war master led from the front, his armor gleaming with an inner light that pulsed like a heartbeat. Hold your fire, Thorn ordered as the first wave approached. Let them get closer. Make every shot count. The tension was unbearable. Sullivan's breathing was loud in the comm channel. Somewhere, someone was softly reciting a prayer. The Kithrai advanced with mechanical precision, their movement synchronized like a deadly dance. At three hundred meters, Thorn gave the signal. The ridge erupted. Nash's mines detonated in precise sequence, channeling the Kithrai exactly where they wanted them. Walsh and Pierce opened up with their railguns, each shot finding a weak point in the alien armor. The rest of the platoon joined in, a devastating crossfire that cut down the first wave in seconds. But the Kithrai were relentless. Where the first wave fell, two more took their place. They learned quickly, using their fallen as cover, returning fire with savage precision. Their plasma weapons turned crystal to slag, their sonic disruptors shattered entire formations. Private Reed was the first to fall a plasma bolt catching him in the chest as he tried to reach a wounded comrade. Corporal Hunter died covering his retreat, his last act being to throw Reed's body clear of the enemy advance. By the time the first hour ended, they had lost five men. The second assault came with shield generators, massive energy barriers that absorbed their fire while the Kithrai advanced. Thorne watched his ammunition counters dropping rapidly. Nash, those charges ready? Yes, sir, but we'll lose our best cover. Do it. Um, the demolition charges brought down tons of crystal, crushing dozens of Kithrai and destroying their shields. But it also exposed the human positions to fire from the flanks. They fell back to their secondary positions, tightening their perimeter. The battle became a blur of desperate moments. Sullivan, his legs shattered by a sonic blast, still managing to hold his position. Frost taking on a Kithrai blade master in hand-to-hand -hand combat when his weapon failed. Walsh and Pierce, calling out targets until their voices were raw. The Kithrai adapted to each of their tactics, but the humans adapted faster. When ammunition ran low, they scavenged Kithrai weapons. When positions became untenable, they created new ones. Every meter of ground was paid for in blood, both human and alien. Dawn approached, painting the battlefield in surreal hues of purple and gold. The fighting had been continuous for four hours. Fifteen men remained, their ammunition nearly spent. The Kithrai bodies were piled so high they formed new cover. Then came a moment that would be recorded in both human and Kithrai histories. Warmaster Nixus's voice boomed across the battlefield, automatically translated by their suits. You have fought with honor, humans. Surrender now, and you will be treated with respect. Never has my legion encountered such resistance. You have earned the right to live. Thorn looked at his remaining men. Frost was nursing a plasma burn that had melted half his armor. Walsh had one eye swollen shut, down to his last magazine. Young Sullivan, despite his shattered leg, still held his position with unwavering determination. Counteroffer, Thorne replied on an open channel. 
Retreat now, and we'll let you keep your dignity. There was a moment of silence. Then, incredibly, a sound that their translators identified as laughter came from the war master. The Kithrai response was immediate and overwhelming. They came in a solid wave, sacrificing hundreds to cross the killing ground. Thorn's men met them with everything they had left. When the ammunition ran dry, they fought with combat knives and improvised weapons. Frost died protecting Sullivan from a Kithrae blade master, his last words a defiant curse. Walsh and Pierce made their last stand together in their sniper nest, detonating their position rather than be captured. Nash used his last demolition charge to collapse a crystal spire onto a Kithrae heavy walker, taking himself and dozens of enemies with it. One by one, the defenders fell. But they did not fall easily, and they did not fall alone. For every human that died, dozens of Kithrai fell. The ridge became a slaughterhouse, the crystals stained with blood of multiple colors. In the end, it was just Thorn and Nixus. The Warmaster's armor was scarred, its weapons spent. Thorn's suit was barely functional, running on emergency power. Why? Nixus asked as they circled each other in the growing light. You must have known this was futile. Your deaths were certain. Thorn smiled behind his cracked visor. Look up. The sky was burning. The evacuation fleet had returned, not with reinforcements, but with the entire third fleet. The six hours they'd bought had been enough to bring an armada. The morning sky blazed with the fire of capital ships engaging in orbit. As orbital strikes began raining down on the Kithrae positions, Thorne's suit finally failed. He fell to his knees, looking at the rising suns. They had done it. The civilians were safe. The fleet was here. The last thing he saw was Nixus kneeling beside him, not to finish him, but in a gesture of respect that would change the relationship between their species forever. The 36 held that ridge for seven hours against an army. The veteran finished, touching the names again. Only three survived, but they changed the course of the war. The Kithrae had never encountered such resistance, such determination. After Helios Ridge, they began to fear us, but more importantly, they began to respect us. Six months later, they sued for peace. The cadet traced the letters of Wade Thorne's name. Were you there, sir? The old man smiled sadly, adjusting his prosthetic leg. I was. Private Ash Sullivan at your service. Now, let me tell you about Lieutenant Thorne. Let me tell you about the man who taught an alien empire that humanity doesn't know how to give up. In the aftermath of the Battle of Helios Ridge, the Kithrai Empire commissioned their own memorial alongside the human one. It bears a single line in both languages. Here fell warriors worthy of legend. We name them brothers. Below the memorial, visitors often find offerings left by both humans and Kithrai, symbols of a respect forged in the crucible of that impossible battle. And in Kithrai military academies, they still teach their warriors about the 36 and what it means to face humans in combat. They teach them about the day when 36 soldiers changed the destiny of two species.